Hi, I'm attorney Bill Bronchuk and welcome to Wednesday webinars. Today we're going to be talking about how to retire with millions tax free. And the way to do that, of course, as you probably surmised from my email announcement, is what's you what's called a checkbook IRA. A checkbook IRA, which is a form of self-directed IRA that you can use to invest in real estate amongst other things. If you have questions as we go, please type them into the comment section and I'll get to them as I can. Some shocking retirement stats that I pulled off the internet. Median income of a retired person now is $22,000 a year. That is pitiful. Unless, of course, you live in rural Florida and you go to dinner at 4 o'clock. I don't think that's the kind of retirement we're all looking for. In retirement, 5% of people in this country will own 80% of the assets. By 2025, there'll be two workers for each retiree. Think about that one. When the Social Security system was first set up, there were something like 12 to 15 people working for each retiree to tax for the retirement generation. It's not like when the government takes Social Security out of your paycheck, they put it in what Al Gore used to call a lock box. It's not locked. They're taxing the next generation to pay for the retired generation. So it's just a marker. And if there's only two workers for each retiree in 2025, that means one or two things. One, the retirees are going to be getting less. Or two, they're going to be getting it later. As much as people don't like to touch that third rail in politics of touching Social Security and Medicare, they have to change the system. It's going to go broke because there's just less people working compared to retired people. And here's another interesting stat. In retirement age, 39% of people support their parents and or adult children at retirement. So not only do you have to worry about your retirement, you're going to have to worry about the retirement also taking care of either adult children or your at one or more of your aging parents. So there's different ways to get there. One of them is savings. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of them is savings. So let's look at savings. You start at age 40, you save 5,000 a year, assume a 5% return, which is most people assume in the market, and you can retire at age 62 with $313,288. Wah, wah, wah. That is not enough. And it's not even enough in today's dollars, much less in 22 years from now's dollars. Remember, you have to adjust for inflation. So the problem is, first of all, a third of your profits are shared with your silent partner. That's the government. Second of all, it's just not enough to get there. So let's look at tax deferred savings. That would be in like a traditional IRA or 401k. If you started at age 40, invested the same $5,000 a year in a tax-free vehicle like an IRA or 401k, and assume a 5% return, you'll retire with $491,718. Still very, very, very short of where we want to be. But instead, if we looked at <clears throat> higher rates of return, because saving money cannot make you rich. You can't save at 3%, 2%, even 5% and become wealthy. It's just not mathematically possible. So if you invest your money, start at age 40, invest 5,000 a year in a Roth IRA, which is completely tax-free, as opposed to a 401k or a traditional IRA, which is taxed on the way out. I don't really like to call it tax deferred because a 1031 exchange is tax deferred. An IRA, even a traditional IRA or 401k, it's not tax deferred, it's tax-free income. But to the extent and when you take it out, you're taxed on the way out. So it's not really tax deferred, that's not really an accurate description. It's tax-free, but the question is, do you get taxed on the way out or not? With a Roth, not. You would retire at age 62 in this case with almost $3 million tax-free, completely tax-free. What changed? The return. The return. 5% worth of versus 20%. It's not four times. It's exponential. Every 1% increment in return that you get, it's that much more that you're going to be making in retirement. So you might want to be looking at a Roth IRA or at the very least, 
a 401k or traditional IRA and get a higher rate of return. And how do you do that? Well, we'll talk about that in a moment. I mean, the obvious answer for those of you watching on my list, probably going to be real estate. You know, real estate is a known entity for many of you. And it, although it has risk, all investment has risks, you know, we have to say that. But if you are adept at real estate, if you're educated, if you are knowledgeable, then the risk is quite minimal. Uh, even, dare I say, less risky than investing in the stock market. You know, if you've got a rental property and Iran wakes up one day and has the bomb, you know, the stock market may drop a thousand or two thousand points, but you're still going to get your rent on your little rental property. It's not going to affect that. Um, so, in some sense, there's, you know, the, rental properties or in the right neighborhoods are, are much less susceptible to world conditions like the stock market is. So what is an IRA? An IRA is an individual retirement account. And I underline individual because any individual can have one. It doesn't matter if you're working for a company, working for yourself. It's not attached to an employer plan like a 401k. That means it doesn't matter where your income is earned, you can contribute it to your IRA as long as you have earned income. And any individual can have one. That means you, your kids, even your grandkids. You don't have to be 18 to have an IRA. And wouldn't it be awesome, as I'll explain later, if you could contribute money to your kids' and grandkids' IRAs and then pull them all together and invest in high returns in real estate or other assets? We'll get back to that in a little bit. It does require a custodian. And the typical custodians you're probably familiar with, Fidelity, Schwab, Edward Jones, etc. They are the custodian of your account and you direct them what to invest in. Now, an IRA can be traditional, which we talked about before, which means you get a tax deduction when you make a contribution. And then on the way out, as you take it out, you're taxed for every dollar that you take out. It's income in that year. So depending on what rate of taxation you are at with that extra income will determine the tax rate on those withdrawals. Whereas a Roth, you don't get a deduction going in. Let's say you put 5,000 into your Roth IRA, you don't get a $5,000 deduction in that tax year, but it grows tax-free and it comes out tax-free. So Roth is definitely a better deal. So if you want your IRA to be permanently tax-free, you should convert it into a Roth if you can, because there are income limitations and there are limitations. Um, there's also a tax event, of course. We'll talk about that in a little bit if you convert your traditional into a Roth. So what is a self-directed IRA? A self-directed IRA legally is no different than a you know, there's traditional IRA and then there's Roth IRA, and then there's other kinds of IRAs. There's ro there's rollover IRAs, there's inherited IRAs, there's simple IRAs, there's SEP IRAs. The main two we're going to talk about is traditional and, and Roth. But a self-directed IRA simply means it allows you to, to invest in a broader range of investments than the typical custodian allows. So if you open an account with Edward Jones or Fidelity or Schwab, um, what you're going to find is that you have some self-direction in that you can invest in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs, etc., but not everything that the law allows. It can be traditional self-directed. It can be Roth. Now, why haven't I heard of this before? Because only 3% of accounts in this country are self-directed. It's just general ignorance. People don't know about this. Plus, Fidelity at, at all, I only pick on them because they're the biggest, um, they can't profit from these transactions that you do outside of stocks, bonds, ETFs, et cetera, mutual funds. If you want to buy real estate, they're not real estate brokers, so they don't offer it. That doesn't mean it's not legal. It just means they don't offer it. And the IRS doesn't require them to particularly offer things other than what they want to offer and make a profit on. That's, and that's really unfortunate because it's sort of like a lie by omission that you assume that because you log into your Fidelity account, these are the choices. That's all the choices you have. That's not true. What you have to do is you have to roll your account from one of the big ones that don't support other assets, investments in your IRA into a more boutique operation that does allow it and that allows you to do complete self-direction. So what investments are permitted in an IRA? Well, as a lawyer, of course, I'd never ask what's permitted. I asked what is disallowed. 
and we just don't do that. So here's what's disallowed. The IRS code expressly prohibits collectibles and life insurance, and that's about it. So no rare comics, rare cars, rare coins, paintings, no life insurance policies. That's about it. Now, there are other insurance policies you can get. I mean, you can, if you have a house, you can buy a property liability insurance. You can buy an annuity. That's a form of insurance. But outside of these two things, the, the, the door is wide open. So here's some possible investments, none of which I am expressly telling you to do because investment has risk. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not telling you to invest in anything in particular. I'm just saying these are available. <laughs> Just a quick disclaimer there. Real estate of all kinds. You could do private loans. You can buy tax liens. You could factor someone's receivables. You could do private placements, precious metals, contract options, mobile home parks, mobile home paper, self-storage units, vacation condo, uh, a VRBO uh, um, uh, type of uh, a vacation condo that you rent out or Airbnb. Startup funding. Your neighbor has the, you know, the cure for stupidity. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> I'd invest ten grand in that. Become a multimillionaire, and so much more. So the only things that are expressly prohibited are collectibles and insurance. Everything else is fair game. But if you ask your current custodian if they're one of the big ones, they're going to say that's not allowed, or they're going to say it's too risky. Don't do those things. You know, too risky compared to what? Let me give you an example. Let's say you bought a rental home. Now, you don't take the money out of your IRA and put it in your personal or business account and then buy the real estate. Your IRA will own the deed to the property and the rents will be paid directly to your IRA account. It's not that Fidelity would ever do this, but let's say you had a Fidelity account and they allowed this. So the deed would say as the owner, Fidelity Investments Incorporated, F B O, which means for benefit of account number one, two, one, two, six, four, two. Okay. The tenants would write checks to Fidelity Inc. F B O account number, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If there's any expenses, then you're going to fill out a form and direct your custodian to pay expenses. If there's any income, then you deposit it into your custodial account and you can't touch that money. You can't touch that money because that's a withdrawal. Okay, as long as the money goes into the IRA account, and not into your hands, then you're good. And it's not a withdrawal. And the money is all tax free or tax deferred, depending on the type of account that you have. All right. When you're 59 and a half and retirement age or later, you could start taking withdrawals from your self-directed IRA account. Now, we said there's only two things you can't invest in. Collectibles, insurance. That's easy. Nobody screws that up. But there are certain transactions that are inherently prohibited. And you should be aware of those because that gets a little sticky sometimes in the gray area. So there's first prohibited parties. You'll find that in IRC section 4975. That's Internal Revenue Code. You can Google it if you want, if you could follow it. I read, I've read this section probably 50 times, and I don't still fully understand it, but I understand it about as good as I can can better than most. Um, but there are certain people that are disqualified from buying, selling, lending, borrowing, leasing, renting, you know, to, from you know, uh, your IRA. Okay. So who's the most disqualified party as opposed to your IRA? Who can't buy a piece of real estate from you and vice versa? Well, most people think your spouse, but actually that's true. Your spouse can't, but the most disqualified party is you. You and your IRA are two different parties. So if you own a piece of real estate, can you sell it to your IRA or put it in your IRA as a contribution and from now on it's tax-free? Absolutely not. That it's a prohibited transaction. So you can't borrow from your IRA. You can't lend to your IRA. You can't um, sell property or buy property from yourself, your spouse, parents, grandparents, children, grandchildren, and their spouses, okay? So uh, in-laws are okay, but um, when you go up and down, basically the lineal ascendancy and descendancy, they're all disqualified. So you can't do it with any of them or any of their IRAs. So 
your IRA and your spouse's IRA or your children's IRA or you and your children's IRA are disqualified. Okay. Now, earlier I talked about what about setting up IRAs for your, for your kids and your grandkids and then pooling them together to invest in real estate or something like that. And the answer is there's an exception to the prohibited parties rule. And that is you can co-invest in the same asset as long as you're buying it from somebody who isn't a disqualified party. What do I mean by co-investing? Well, if person A and person B co-purchased a property together, they would be co-owners as tenants in common because they're purchasing it from a third person. Both of them would be, if they put up 50-50 money, they'd be 50-50 owners. So you and let's say your wife's IRA or you, your IRA and your children's IRA could co-own real estate together so long as it was purchased from a third party who wasn't disqualified. That's the exception to prohibited party. So if you wanted to, you could take your, your IRA account, your spouse's IRA, your three kids IRA, and your five grandkids IRA, I think that's 10 accounts, and then all simultaneously purchase a property and co-own it together as tenants in common. That would be a perfectly permitted transaction, okay? And then the money that comes out in terms of profit or rent would come out proportionally to each account in proportion to what each account contributed, all right? Also, we have certain prohibited actions. You cannot guarantee debt. So if you wanted to borrow money with your IRA to buy a property, use a down payment out of your IRA and then borrow the rest, which you can do, by the way, your IRA can borrow money, uh, you just can't guarantee the note. So if you're going to go to a bank and get a traditional type of mortgage loan, and your IRA is putting up 50 grand for the down payment and you're getting a loan for the rest, you can't guarantee that loan personally. That is prohibited, okay? And anything really that it's the sort of catch-all that benefits you even indirectly, I mean, everything benefits you indirectly. I mean, really, let's, let's be honest, because it's your IRA. But you can't, um, let's say, buy an investment property that's a vacation home and use it with your family or let one of your kids live in it. That's an indirect benefit to a disqualified party, which direct benefit actually to a disqualified party. But, um, that's sort of the catch all, you know, you, there is a gray area. I'll admit where something benefits you indirectly, not directly. Um, that is permissible, but you know, it's a sort of case by case basis and you should have a qualified legal or tax advisor to guide you with those transactions that you're, you know, right on the border with. Okay. How do you fund your IRA though? How do we get money in the IRA? Well, there's three ways, a contribution, a rollover, or borrowing. Those are three ways to get money into your IRA to go invest. So you can't just say, I'm opening an IRA and I want to dump a hundred grand in there and go invest. You can't do that. There's three ways. You can make a contribution, which has annual limits, a rollover from another account, or borrow money. So let's go in those, into those individually. Contributions. You can contribute $6,000 a year. If you're 50 and over, $7,000 a year. That's not a lot. That's not a lot, but your spouse can too, and you can do it for your kids and your grandkids. So if you've got three kids and five grandkids, plus you and your spouse, that's 10 accounts. Um, most of them would contribute six, and you and your spouse would contribute seven. So if I counted that right, that's 48 plus 14 is $62,000 a year. And after two years, that's $124,000. You can go out and buy a piece of real estate with that. Remember, you don't have to buy a cash. You can borrow, as we just talked about four minutes ago, right? So we'll talk about that in more detail in just a moment. But remember, in order to have a contribution, you must have that amount of earned income that year earned income. That's W-2 1099 income. Okay. If you have nothing but rental properties, you have no earned income. You can't contribute for that year. So you have to have some sort of property management vehicle that pays you a salary and then you can contribute. And as well as your kids and your grandkids. How do your grandkids get 
earned income. Well, you have the company pay your children. That's easy. Your grandchildren, can we pay them? Well, if they're 12, they could stuff envelopes, probably work on your social media. <laughs> what if they're two? Well, what are they going to do for as a two-year-old for earned income? I'll give you a hint. Pictures. Pictures. You could pay them a photographic sitting fee, not a royalty. That's not earned income. A sitting fee for a beautiful picture that you could put on your website to show your grandchildren. And what's the IRS going to say? They're not cute enough for $6,000? I mean, really, what are they going to say about that? You can contribute past 70 years old, 70, actually 70 and a half, in a traditional IRA. You can in a Roth IRA, though. So if you're 66 and you're just starting out, you probably want to go with a Roth IRA because you can contribute longer. But there's no limits on profits that you can earn in the IRA. People confuse the six or $7,000 that you can contribute in each year with what the IRA invests in. Once the money's in the IRA, it could do as many trades and investments as it wants and make unlimited money. You just can't contribute more than six or $7,000 a year as new money. A rollover is the next way. And you can roll almost anything to anything. You can roll a, an, a traditional to a Roth. And if you do that, you're going to pay tax. Because remember, if you contributed money into a traditional IRA, you got tax deduction for that. So now you got to pay it back. So if you've got $50,000 in a traditional and you wanted to roll it to a Roth, um, if you're younger, I would suggest you do it. And then you're going to have $50,000 and more income that year taxed at whatever rate that puts you in. Um, so let's say it's a third and you pay fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars $16,000 in tax. Ouch. But would you rather pay it on 50,000 or use these techniques and invest in real estate and pay it on a million 20 years later? I think the answer is obvious. If you didn't get the answer, if you don't think the answer is obvious, you know, go back and watch this again. The answer is obvious. You want to pay it on the tax now, not later. You can roll a 401A, a 403B, a 457 plan, or any qualified plan to either. And again, when you roll to a Roth, you do pay taxes. But it's only once, and you never pay it again. Borrowing is the third way. You can borrow money with your IRA. And typical way is with seller financing in real estate. Your, your IRA buys a piece of property, puts 20000 down, and the seller carries the rest. If you do so, you can also go to banks. By the way, you can go to a bank and borrow money with your IRA. Uh, you can use hard money if you're going to flip a property. But all the above, whether it's seller financing, banks, or hard money, all loans must be non-recourse. What does that mean? What that means is the note must specifically say that in the event of default, the lender's only option is to foreclose the property. They can't sue you personally, and they can't get a deficiency against you. And that's a good thing, because that means your IRA is not at risk of losing more. If your IRA borrows, it can only lose the collateral. It can't be sued for any deficiency if the foreclosure auction yields not enough to pay the loan. Also, you can't guarantee the debt. Remember, we talked about that earlier. You can borrow money, but no personal guarantee and no recourse. So seller financing, a perfect example. The IRA gives the seller a down payment. The seller takes a note from the IRA as borrower. The IRA makes payments on the note, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then maybe you rent it out and collect rents. Now, let's talk about the PETA factor. Now, this is not an animal rights group. Some of you figured it out what PETA is, P-I-T-A. What does P-I-T-A mean? I'll give you a hint, pain in the, you get the rest, right? So the way it works is the IRA owns the asset. If it, let's say it's a piece of real estate, the IRA is on the deed. The tenants write checks to the IRA account. The IRA writes checks on a, your mortgage loan if you have one. The IRA writes checks for repairs. Now, every time you do a transaction, whether it's in or out of the IRA, 
it's not click to trade like like you know uh, a TD Ameritrade or, or Fidelity, right? You have to fill out a form to direct the custodian what to do and pay a fee with each transaction. And imagine you had 10 properties, how much of a hassle this would be. Every month, 10 forms, 10 fees for the checks coming in. 10 forms, 10 fees for the mortgage payments going out. Maybe three forms, three fees for repairs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so it really becomes a hassle and it gets quite expensive because these boutique custodians that will do your IRA self-directed, they're, you know, $200 plus a year, not free or $39. Okay, now that seems like a lot, but in, in, in perspective, if you're earning high rates of return, double digit and big double digit, you're not going to complain about two or $300 a year in fees. That's just not a concern. Okay, uh, so... The way around this PETA is to use what's called the checkbook IRA, the checkbook IRA. This is how you get checkbook control over your IRA account without violating any rules. Because normally I said, you can't put money in your personal account, pay expenses, and then put the rest into your IRA at the end of the month. You can't do that. You can't take money out as a loan to borrow to buy property, okay? The the, the IRA owns the asset. So the checkbook IRA works as follows. You have an IRA account. You tell them in a form to become the member, to buy a membership interest and in a newly created LLC. Now this newly created LLC cannot be newly created by you because you are a disqualified party. You can't use an existing LLC. If you're already the member, you're selling the membership to your IRA account disqualified transaction. It's got to be a brand new LLC organized by a non-disqualified party, a non-disqualified party, which is usually like an attorney. Okay. And then once the LLC is formed, your IRA account purchases membership and then they wire money into the LLC's checking account, just like you would do normally. If you bought Google stock, what would you do? You would write a check or wire or bank transfer to Google. They would issue you stock and they'd take the money from you and put it in their checking account. Okay. It's the same thing, but it happens to be a non publicly traded private single member, single owner LLC. And the single owner or member is your IRA account. And then who's the manager of the account? Ah, that would be you. You're a manager of the LLC. Now you're not a member. You're just a manager. A manager is not necessarily a member. A lot of people think that managers have to be members, like managing members, and that's often the case. But you don't have to be a, an owner of the company to be a manager of an LLC. So you're the manager. Your IRA account is the member. The money is in your LLC account. Now the LLC will buy and sell properties or buy and rent properties by itself. So some of the advantages of doing it this way is now we, proper, we we title the property in the LLC instead of in the name of the IRA account, which, you know, for financial privacy is much better, right? You don't want your IRA account on public record on a deed. The LLC will collect the rents. The LLC will write checks for the mortgage loan, the taxes, the insurance, the repairs, et cetera, Okay. And you have complete control over the funds. If you have to wire funds, you just go to your bank and wire funds. You don't have to contact the custodian to do that, which could take days. You could do it in a matter of minutes if you have online banking. Okay. And then when you're ready to take a withdrawal, when you're 59 and a half, you transfer money from the LLC back to the member, which is the IRA account, and take your withdrawal from there. And that's how it works. In the meantime, the funds and the assets sit in the name of the LLC, accumulating income, accumulating value, so on and so forth. Much, much easier way to do it. Much, much easier way to do it. So as a service, something we offer is to help you, number one, roll over your account, organize your LLC, obtain your tax identification number, prepare a very specific operating agreement that's compliant with the IRS rules. Uh, you can't use something from LegalZoom or something generic like that. It doesn't work. Prepare a subscription agreement which in which you're going to purchase the LLC membership. And then we have to draft an attorney opinion letter to the custodian. Every custodian wants an opinion letter that this is valid to cover their backside. Okay. 
And we offer as well compliance support for one year because every transaction you do in your LLC now is not under scrutiny by your custodian. So you got to know what you're doing. You can't screw that up. So you got to know the rules, especially where, where I said earlier, some of it's in a little bit in the gray area and we help you with those uh, compliance transactions. Okay. So just contact us. Uh, here's my number, my email. Well, it's not showing on this slide, but my email is just bill at bronchick.com bill at bronchick.com and if you got an email from me you can just reply and that'll that'll come to me as well and uh we can give you a quote on what it'll cost to set one of these up in your state okay all righty then now would probably be a good time to uh answer questions so post your questions in the box there as we go um yeah, make sure someone mentioned here, make sure you subscribe. If you're not a subs regular subscriber to my YouTube account, do subscribe. Um, so that way you're going to get notifications because I put up, I do this webinar Wednesday and it gives you a reminder, but also I do post videos, you know, several times a week as well. Uh, you can go on my YouTube page if you're watching on Facebook at youtube.com slash Bronchick, where I have dozens and dozens and dozens of real estate and business and tax and legal uh, videos that you can enjoy for free. So make sure you sign up and subscribe. Okay. Some questions here. Uh, let's see. Susan asks, um, with the checkbook IRA, do I have to file a tax return? Um, that's an excellent question, Susan. And the answer is, the way I just described it, the answer would be no. Uh, you don't need a federal income tax return because this LLC only has one member one member. So the one member being your your IRA account, your IRA account. And in that case, since it only has one member, it doesn't file a return. So the member being the IRA account doesn't file a tax return. So there'd be no federal income tax reporting. Uh, Kathy asks, how much do you need in your IRA to start or roll over one self-directed? Well, the way I look at it, Kathy, is the vehicle is more important than the amount. Any deal that you can do with little or no money down can be done in an IRA with little or no money down. So if you had $5,000, could you use $1,000 earnest money on a purchase contract or an option or a lease option and then flip that and make five or 10? And now you've just, you know, you know, more than quadruple, what is that, quintupled your uh, investment in, inside of 30 or 45 days. Um, and then when you get enough money in there, you could you can use a down payment and then borrow the rest uh, or get seller financing to buy a piece of real estate or partner with someone or, you know, whatever. Any deal that can be done with little or no money down could be done little or no money down inside your uh, checkbook IRA. So you don't need a ton of money. And the more that helps, the better. Yeah. I mean, if you have a million dollars and it would certainly make purchasing houses easier, at least in the short term before you refinance them, um, or if you're going to flip them, but, uh, you, it's not an absolute necessity that you have any specific amount of money. Danny asks, what's your thoughts on the property in the LLC versus a land trust? Uh, both both, uh, Danny. Um, in the example where I mentioned earlier with co-ownership, um, you could set up a land trust and the land trust would have beneficiaries, which would be like your IRA and your spouse's IRA. Uh, but still, you don't have a, a checking account there to really, um, to really deal in. So what I would suggest, if you want to do something with your, you know, your spouse and your kids and your grandkids, set up an LLC and have all of those accounts be the members. Now that will file a federal tax return. It's a partnership now, but each IRA account is, gets a K1, which is basically ignored because those are tax-free vehicles, right? But you still have to file a federal income tax return. Um, and that would be a way to pool money together with multiple accounts and then go invest in real estate for the benefit of all the accounts. And could you title the property in a land trust owned by the LLC? That's the way I would recommend it. Okay. Good question though. All righty then. 
let's scroll down these comments here. Let's see. I already answered that one. And, uh, oh, Jonathan has a good question. Um, can you roll a an employer plan like a 401A, which is a government, like government 401K, uh, into a self-directed plan? The answer is yes. You can roll a 401A, 403B, 457 plan. Any Almost anything can be rolled into a self-directed plan. And that answers Danny's comment too, which is, can I move my 401K to an IRA? And the answer is absolutely you can. Now, if you're working for that employer now, they may not let you roll that. You have to talk to your um, human resources. A lot of them won't let you roll till you quit that job or you're over a certain age, but it's really up to the terms of their plan, so you have to ask human resources. Now, if you do have a 401k, by the way, you can borrow from it up to $50,000 if you have at least 50,000 vested. Um, and that's usually like a five-year loan at five or six percent interest, but you're paying interest back to your own plan. So how bad is that? But the money goes into your own hands and is not tax-free. So, I mean, as you earn money from it, it's tax-free as you take the loan, but if you earn money from that, that's outside of your plan and is subject to tax. But hey, if you got 50 grand in a, in a 401k, you're working for an employer, uh, it's, if it's not earning you double-digit returns in the market, then maybe you want to invest some of it in real estate. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you self-direct a 401k? The answer is yes. If you have your own, you, there's, there's a vehicle known as a solo K or individual 401k. If it's just you or you and your spouse and no full-time vested employees, you can have a solo K. And a solo K, like a self-directed IRA, can be invested in anything you want because you're the trustee of the plan. Um, those plans do require a tax return generally, um, you, but much, have much higher contribution limits, much higher. Between you and your spouse, over a hundred grand a year can be pumped in there, but you have to have income from that company and to to do that so you have to be you know paying yourself like 250 a year to get that big of a deduction and then you have matching just like in a 401k where but you're matching yourself because it's your own plan um so if you're older and you have your own business and you have you have a lot of income and you have no employees other than you and your spouse no full-time employees then you may want to consider a self-directed 401k instead of a self-directed IRA, which has lower contribution limits. Okay, good questions, everybody. All righty then. Uh, I think that about does it for the questions. So thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, give me a call or drop me an email at bill at bronchick.com if you're interested in setting up a checkbook IRA. Um, it's a one-time fee. We give you full support. We do it everything soup to nuts for you, and it's a lot more affordable than you think it is. And um, if you know real estate or business, uh, other investments that are non-traditional that you want to earn high rates of return, um, this is a great vehicle to do that with. Alrighty. Thanks everyone for joining. We'll see you next Wednesday. Signing off.